difficult when you are building socialism against a, a, a background, formidable background of capitalism. You have to try and transform the Ian Smiths uh, uh, into being socialists. And uh, he tells me he's a socialist already. Uh, we just had the end of the war. In traditional African beliefs, they say that the rain comes to wash away the footsteps, to wash away the blood, to wash away the skeletons. All the bad things of the war were cleaned out. Mugabe healed the wounds of war with a government of national unity. Joshua Nkomo was Minister of Home Affairs, and a white farmer, Dennis Norman, became Minister of Agriculture. Well, let me describe the first cabinet meeting. Um, I think everyone was a little apprehensive. Um, it, it was new. Nobody had ever served in a cabinet in their lives. When it came to the end, uh, we sort of got up to leave. Uh, then Mugabe said, oh, there's just, just one point I'd, I'd like to make. Because although it was a cabinet meeting, there was a variety of dress uh, from uh, Hawaiian shirts to Marxi Tung uh, tunics to, well, nobody quite in shorts, but uh, it was a mixture of, of clothing apparel. And Mugabe said, um, I'd just like to say that if you wish to remain cabinet ministers, I expect you to dress as cabinet ministers. I never saw anybody in any meeting other than in a suit from that day onwards. You know, we can never have peace in the country unless the peasant population is satisfied um, in regard to land. At the moment, there is that grievance. It's not deep-seated yet because there is hope that government is going to get more land. And I do hope that uh, those of you with m land to spare can allocate it to the state. We are not seizing it. We are buying it from you. And we would want you to uh, uh, be understanding on that subject. And here is an example of a farm some 5,000 acres in extent, of which 4,000 acres are under crops of different types. The owner of the farm... Since the British arrived in 1888, a handful of settlers had occupied over half the arable land. They took over the country and ruled over the peasant farmers, many of whom they drafted in as cheap labor. Sometimes they have to be taught the most rudimentary mechanical movements. But they progress rapidly to more complicated industrial tasks. Independence brought great changes. Zimbabwe focused on developing peasant farming and on land redistribution with funds from the Lancaster House Agreement. Three million hectares bought from white farmers were given to blacks in one of Africa's most successful resettlement schemes. We became the bread basket of the region and precisely because of the policies of President Robert Mugabe. I don't know whether Zimbabweans re remember the, the so-called agricultural extension officers uh, or agrotechs, the people that went into the rural areas to help uh, poor rural small producers to produce things like maize, things like cotton, groundnuts, and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, it was all there in 1980, 1981, 1982. At independence, the communal farmers or the rural farmers marketed not more than 25% of commercial produce. By the end of 1986, 65% of all commercially marketed maize was coming from the communal areas. 70% of all commercially marketed cotton was coming from the communal areas. And about 30, 35% of marketed beef was coming from the communal <laughs> Prime Minister Mugabe, presumably as, a, as an educationist himself, had this profound belief in education. He would always say, all our people must gain an education. So government committed itself to supporting a free education policy. 
a free health policy. I am what I am today because of the education policies of President Robert Mugabe and many more. The people that you're talking about when we started uh, this, this, this interview uh, who are now abroad, educated in Zimbabwe, the health facilities in Zimbabwe, doctors and nurses, uh, you know, the police force and that kind of, kind of stuff. Already remarkable things were happening. He was addressing, he and his government of course, were addressing the people in the periphery who had never been attended to before, who didn't have schools and clinics and so on, that's where he went, to the periphery. Right on the Mozambique border, he put up a clinic. Schools, the place was growing already in 1982. Uh, it's only a year, a year and a half after independence. <laughs> Peace was rudely shattered when South Africa blew up Zimbabwe's fuel supplies. Terrified that black majority rule would spread to her, South Africa began destabilizing all her neighbors. In political terms, the South African strategy has been to portray the image of this region as one of instability, and, uh, and uh, chronic uh, 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 turmoil within our member states. In the economic field, we have paid heavily and we have paid highly from destabilization. Zimbabwe's export links through Mozambique were destroyed by a South African-funded rebel army. Mugabe sent in troops. High cost of defense drained the economy, but that didn't stop the program of development. <laughs> Mugabe's determined defiance of South Africa and apartheid paid off. He was elected chairman of the International Non-Aligned Movement, a position of enormous prestige amongst developing nations. What is needed now is action. I earnestly urge members of this movement should agree to adopt and implement for a start the voluntary selective sanctions against South Africa outlined in the declarations adopted in Paris and Vienna. Mugabe was also fated by the West, drank tea with the Queen of England and was eventually knighted. He was this Marxist terrorist who actually transmogrified into a very English uh, kind of leader, very respectable and quite conservative. Robert Mugabe is what we call a Western-oriented gentleman. The man is immaculate in his dressing, he is virtually British in his table manners and, you know, decor, etiquette, the lot. But um, this is the same man who, is, who hates Britain with a passion. This is the same man also who loves music by Cliff Richard. He is, in fact, you know, the character of, you know, self-contradictions. He's the most charming of men um, on a one-to-one -on -one, one, one -one basis. Absolutely charming, very personal, very friendly and that kind of stuff. To the extent that uh, after my meetings with people, I've always said, I believe that somebody's keeping the president completely out of touch with what is happening. Because I don't believe that the men that I've just met, the men who are so warm, so charming, can do the kind of things that people say he's done. Everyone was very happy about the 1980 situation, quite excited. I think the hopes were very high. Um, and I think President Mugabe, then Prime Minister, was very highly regarded, I think. 
he was respected by everyone uh, and all our hopes were in his leadership to get the country to a better country. In the 1980s, it was very easy to see in all other parts of the country other than Matabeleland that wonderful things were taking place. Matabeleland was the heartland of Zapu and Joshua and Como. When arms caches were unearthed on a Zapu property, the old rivalry was reignited. Mugabe pointed his finger at the Minister of Home Affairs. The dissidents bear all the time as they operate. They are very frank, very bold. They are operating in the name of father of Zimbabwe, Dr. Joshua Nkomo. He then is the father of dissidents. And so, <laughs> what am I to say? Mugabe dismissed Nkomo from government. I've never done anything wrong, and Robert knows it. I told you this is for personal power. Let him stand up and deny it. Mugabe then mobilized his strongest force. The 5th Brigade was a lethal, Korean-trained special unit answerable directly to him. I would like to pay tribute to our comrades in arms, the instructors from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, on the 26th or so of January the following year, the 5th Brigade went into Matabeleland. And the first onslaught was indescribably violent. The Matabeleland Kukuraundi massacres were really aimed at the population in general to crush Zapo. That was the first sign that things were going wrong. Number of people were pushed into a hut and the hut was set on fire, and the people inside it were burnt. There was one survivor. I question the integrity of a president of a country who stands up in full view of uh, everybody and condones violence, not uh, perhaps euphemistically or you know, in a roundabout manner, but directly threatens those that oppose him with death. And a few days down the line, people get killed. Unless there are uh, real incidents brought to my notice, I cannot agree that they are carrying out any excesses at all. If the dissident uh, activity will eliminate, I can assure you, we have treated them with uh, kid gloves all along. But we are, go we are going all out now to crush them, and we'll crush them. <laughs> One of the songs it went something of that nature. Uh, so we were made to sing those songs repeatedly, repeatedly dancing. People were being beaten. Those who did not know Shona, sometimes they were made to file up at that end. One by one, either they will be pushed over into the, the, the mine shaft or they will be shot using pistols. They told all kinds of uh, stories uh, regarding alleged atrocities uh, perpetrated uh, by the 5th Brigade. But uh, 
they fail to prove them, you see. True, there may have been one or two incidents, but uh, where, wherever you have operations, you're bound to have one or two untoward uh, incidents, but not the mass graves which they talked about. Where are they? You travel the whole length and breadth of Matberlag and you won't find a single mass grave. So the man's hands are tied behind his back? Yes. Tied with wire? These are two hills, you see. It was absolutely vital, in my view, for the well-being of Matabililand, for the well-being, therefore, of the country, that the truth was told. That was it, breaking the silence. In March 1997, we released the Human Rights Report, Breaking the Silence. And it is atrocious in what it reports. <laughs> I think Mugabe has always been a master at propaganda. He has been a master at spin. And so that spin that this is the anti-apartheid, this is the struggle against apartheid, uh, actually worked. And certainly the whole of Africa ignored Kukuraundi. Uh, the British ignored it. Mugabe forced his rival, Joshua Nkomo, to unite with him. The new party was called ZANU Patriotic Front, or ZANU PF. The political tensions lessened. There were negotiations which ultimately led uh, to ZAPU being swallowed up by ZANU-PF in terms of the Unity Accord, which was signed on the 22nd of December 1987. Our unity is so vital, is so important for the development of this country. There must, there must be no deceit. We must not deceive each other. We must mean what we say. We must do what we say. We must do what we say. Having swallowed Zaku, Mugabe changed the constitution. He became executive president and the head of the armed forces. Now he tasted real power. But new opposition appeared, accusing the cabinet of corruption. Popular singer Thomas Mopfumo denounced corruption in song, but his music was banned from being broadcast. The next challenge came from one of Mugabe's oldest comrades, Edgar Tekere decided to run against Mugabe and Zanu in the upcoming presidential elections. When we came from the bush, we did not bring in our manifesto that vote us in so we can establish a one-party state. People who have left the party can come back to it. The door is very wide open, but they must be prepared to conform. To rob the Zimbabwean of his right to make his choice freely and to interfere with that is to ask for a tragic downfall. Mugabe used television to fight back. This is one way to die. Another is to vote Zoom. Don't commit suicide. Don't be foolish. Vote ZANU-PF and leave. <laughs> Mugabe won and I lost. <laughs> The economy was weakened by the high costs of development and fighting apartheid. Zimbabwe was desperate for investment. The collapse of international socialism, that was a major disappointment for Robert Mugabe because he is uh, openly stated that he is an avowed you know, socialist. 
And um, so when international socialism collapsed, there was only one route left, and that was capitalism. And so capitalism could only be followed then by appealing to the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the um, International Monetary Fund, for, uh, for support, for financial support. Subsidies were literally re removed from basic commodities, making things extremely expensive for each and every person. In fact, unemployment increased because then what ASAP required was that it had to, um, uh, it demanded um, uh, a lean, thin um, uh, employment uh, capacity, especially in the public, in the public sector. So there was a lot of retrenchments. Um, so thereby increasing the unemployment rate in Zimbabwe. Times were hard. A devastating drought in 1992 hit peasant farmers badly, and the yield from commercial crops was down too. In the same year, Sally Mugabe died. His first wife, there's no doubt about it. She was a, a very strong personality. She was more politically aware, and uh, she exercised a very great influence on him. If he did or said something that she didn't agree with, I think she told him in uncertain terms, no, that was wrong. At the age of 72, the president shocked the nation by marrying his secretary, Grace Marufu. The couple already had two children. Among the loudest cheers of the day were for President Mandela. Sitting next to him at the reception was Grasso Michelle. Nelson Mandela, uh, bigger than life, amazing, amazing charisma. Uh, a man that uh, President Robert Mugabe wished he was, but he wasn't. Land redistribution, which had started in the early 80s, had stopped. 